Many smokers find themselves unable to answer this very basic question of why they smoke. They'll sometimes give the excuse that they smoke because they like smoking. But when they really consider all the problems that go with smoking, they realize this really isn't true. They, are, they don't enjoy being smokers anymore. Often people try to figure out why they smoke. They try to figure out why they started to smoke. Like that will somehow answer why they continue to smoke. Well, the reason a person starts smoking and the reason they continue to start smoking usually have absolutely nothing to do with each other. What starts people on smoking is usually a simple offer for a cigarette. It may be from a family member, it may be from a friend, but the offer again is for a cigarette. And at the time, a cigarette probably does not seem like a big deal. A cigarette won't kill them. A cigarette won't cost them anything. It's being offered to them for free. And it seems like either a sociably acceptable thing to do at that point in time or a peer pressure kind of thing to do at that time. But whatever it is, it doesn't seem like it should be a major issue. After all, it's only a cigarette. You know, what's the big deal? It's only a cigarette. The big deal is... Over time, it doesn't stay only a cigarette. Over time, people find themselves smoking quantities they never dreamed imaginable. What they thought was going to be a very limited usage of this product, or for a very limited time, will very often turn into years or decades of quantities they never believed possible for them to smoke. The reason smoking goes on to such long-term usage is because we're dealing with an addictive product. We're dealing with cigarettes which contain nicotine, and nicotine is one of the most powerfully addictive drugs known to man. Most people who experiment with nicotine will go on to use nicotine for a much longer time period than they ever planned on. This is evident from surveys which are done at the high school age level. When high school age kids who smoke already are interviewed and asked, how many of them think they'll be smoking five years later? Only 5% of the kids interviewed will answer that question in the affirmative. What really will happen, though, is if these kids are followed up for seven to nine years, 75% of them will still be smoking. What that means is for every one student who thought they were going to become addicted smokers, 15 of them will become addicted smokers. It's the rare exception that does not. Most people take up smoking not planning on becoming addicted smokers. They don't understand the addiction going into it. But then they go on to get addicted, and some people use this as an excuse for why they can't give it up, because they are now addicted that there's no way out. Being addicted to a drug does not mean that you cannot get off that drug. The fact is, we have more ex-smokers alive today in America than current smokers, meaning half the people who used to smoke in this country have quit smoking. This fact alone should make it clearly evident to anybody that quitting smoking is possible, no matter how long a person has smoked, no matter how many cigarettes they smoke per day, and no matter how addicted they believe they are to nicotine. Once addicted, keeping nicotine levels constant is what causes people to smoke. The next series of slides will illustrate how fluctuating nicotine levels will affect the way people smoke under different conditions. Nicotine is being represented in green in these illustrations. As long as the smoker has their full complement of nicotine, they're going to be relatively comfortable. If that nicotine level starts to drop, they could become a little bit irritable, and if that nicotine level gets real low, they're basically thrown into a drug withdrawal state. So, what causes a drop in serum nicotine level, or stated another way, why would a smoker feel that they need their cigarettes anyway? The first variable that will affect the rate at which a person smokes is simply time. The distribution half-life of nicotine in the human body is 20 to 30 minutes, meaning half an hour after a person smokes their cigarette, half the available nicotine to their brain is gone. You can find some smokers who you can set your watch by that will light up in a 20 to 30 minute cycle. In today's day and age, this is a little bit harder to find because people are limited where they can smoke. This is causing the case where people are either under smoking or over smoking all the time. Under smoking when they're being restricted from smoking and over smoking when they can finally get out to get cigarettes to try to tide them over to the next time when they'll be able to get such availability. Another factor that affects the rate that a person smokes today is their metabolism of nicotine. Over time people build up tolerance to nicotine, meaning they have to smoke more and more cigarettes to get the same dosage that a lower amount of cigarettes used to have delivered. 
The longer a person smokes, the more efficient their body becomes at ridding themselves of nicotine. Their brain is trying to keep a constant supply, and yet their body is getting rid of it faster and faster. This is referred to as developing tolerance to a drug. In the case of smoking, very few people take a cigarette when they're 12 years old, go, wow, that's great, I'll smoke two packs a day the rest of my life. They start out smoking one a day, to two a day, to five a day. All of a sudden, they can reach quantities they never dreamt possible, quantities they never planned on smoking. But as their body got more and more efficient at getting rid of nicotine, they'd have to smoke more cigarettes to get the same desirable effects. Over time, though, a desirable effect is not getting the feeling they got when they first took up smoking. It's more so avoiding withdrawal that not smoking is causing to kick in. The last variable that can increase or decrease the amount a person smokes are changes in urine pH. The more acidic the urine becomes, the quicker a person will excrete nicotine. And the quicker a person will excrete nicotine, the more cigarettes they'll have to smoke in that duration of time. One factor that will cause the urine to turn more acidic is stress. Stress has a physiological effect on the body. It makes the urine acidic. This happens to smokers and this happens to non-smokers. To a non-smoker, there's no real sensation. There's no real effect that they would even know that it was happening. In smokers, it's much more complex. And this loss of nicotine during stress is what causes smokers to feel they need to smoke when under stress. A later slide will go into greater detail explaining this process. Another thing that causes nicotine right excretion by increasing urine pH is alcohol consumption. And most smokers know when they drink alcohol, they smoke more. If you ask them how much more, they will smoke a lot more while drinking. The reason being, again, is the alcohol is acidifying the urine and making them lose nicotine. While many people will say, well, they smoke for more when they drink for social reasons or just to fit in, if they reflect back the times when they were at social gatherings where everyone's joining in for a few drinks, and so they join in, and then they find out they're the only smokers there, they will generally attest to the fact that they still had to smoke. Even though the peer pressure was likely not to smoke anything, it made no difference at that point. They had an increased need for nicotine, which meant they felt the need to smoke more. One other product that would cause this effect is mega dosages of vitamin C. About 20 years ago, it hit the media that vitamin C was destroyed by smoking. Many smokers thought, like, this isn't good, they need vitamin C. So they started taking supplemental dosages to try to make up for what smoking would destroy. The problem is, the extra vitamin C would acidify the urine. That would make them lose nicotine. That would make them smoke a few extra cigarettes. That would basically destroy the new vitamin C they were taking in, which was turning them into a heavier smoker than they were before they started the process. Most gimmicks, most games people play trying to make smoking safer will backfire on them. It will turn them into heavier smokers than they would have been if they just didn't use the product at all. The safe way to basically minimize the risk of smoking is to stop smoking. Again, the first variable affecting smoking rates is time. The longer a person smokes, the longer they go without smoking, and the better their body gets at establishing a tolerance to nicotine, they'd have to smoke more cigarettes. It used to be smoking one cigarette in a given time period would be enough, but as tolerance got more established, a person would have to smoke two cigarettes in that time period, and over time, it can go up to multiples of that amount. This picture may strike a chord with many smokers, the movie intermission. They could think of mad dashes they would make into the lobby when they would be able to get a break to go smoke a cigarette. A new problem facing smokers these days are movies are getting longer and longer, and basically they no longer have intermissions in them, which means smokers are chain smoking, usually on the way to a film, and then during the film they're going into withdrawal. Many people will remember getting up and walking out of scenes that they really wanted to know what was happening to have a cigarette. Then there's those smokers who say, oh, they never did that. Well, right, but their movie-going experience is literally going to be watching the clock and hoping this movie is over any minute now. When they should be able to focus on the film, if that film is going too long, they are getting uncomfortable and beginning not to enjoy longer movies. It gets to a point that if they know a movie is way too long, they're going to wait for this to come out in video because they know there's no way they can comfortably watch this in a theater. The first cigarette in the morning is often one of the most crucial cigarettes for people. They will refer to it as one of the best cigarettes they ever have in a day, but it's beyond that. It's a cigarette that they need. 
again, the longest a person will normally go without smoking is when they're sleeping. Unless they're waking up in the middle of the night for a cigarette, which a number of smokers do, it makes this a critical cigarette. Some smokers have learned that it really doesn't pay to get out of bed if they don't smoke a cigarette. This is where the fear of quitting can become so dramatic because they feel like they can never get out of bed again. So not only are they quitting smoking, but life as they know it is over. People must understand from the start that everything they did as a smoker, they can do as an ex-smoker, but they will eventually have to learn how. Another situation that shows how time affects smoking was the example of a telephone ringing. Many people can remember at a time when a phone used to be in one area of the house, the cigarettes used to be in the other area of the house, the telephone would ring, and the smoker would not necessarily run toward the phone. They may very often run toward the direction of the cigarettes as opposed to where the phone was. Whenever I would point this out to people, they would laugh and wonder, how did I know their behavior? It's not like they learned this from watching another person doing it, but somehow the telephone ringing became a conditioned response that it was time to smoke a cigarette. How that happened was one day the telephone rang and the person that just smoked a cigarette felt fine and made the mistake of going to answer the phone. The problem was the person at the other end of the phone was long-winded. They started to talk and talk and talk. They went a half an hour, no sign of shutting up. They went an hour and didn't shut up. When that smoker finally hung up the phone, they'd make a mad dash for their cigarettes. They would get 10 or 20 calls like that over some time frame and pretty soon they would learn, don't do that anymore. When the phone rings, go for a cigarette. It becomes an automatically conditioned response. There are some people who believe they can never talk on a phone again without a cigarette. But again, it fits into the same category. Everything a person does as a smoker, they can do as an ex-smoker. Again, they have to learn how. And the way they do that is by getting a series of phone calls over time, answering without a cigarette, and breaking that association. Another situation people have tied into their smoking are coffee breaks. Just the word coffee break means a cigarette break to many smokers. People can drink coffee with or without their cigarettes, although there is an interaction between coffee and nicotine. Where alcohol makes you lose nicotine and makes you smoke more, nicotine interferes with caffeine, meaning if a person is used to a certain amount of caffeine and they now quit smoking, they may find that taking the same amount of caffeine as they did in the past may cause them to feel wired in a way that it never did before. In a sense, they're metabolizing caffeine differently now that they do not smoke anymore. And some people will find out that they will have to cut back on caffeine consumption or have negative effects from caffeine in a way that they never did before from the same dosage. This doesn't mean that they can never drink caffeine again, but they may have to change the amount that they could drink, bringing it down to a level lower than when they were smoking. As I said before, I was going to address once again the interaction between smoking and stress, and it really comes down to an interaction between nicotine and stress. Here we have two illustrations. On the left is a non-smoker. A non-smoker, if they encounter stress, they become stressed. That's just the natural function of stress. They can become irritable, they can become upset, but physiologically, they're just going to have the effect of the stress itself. If they solve the stress, they become happy again. If they don't solve the stress, they get frustrated. On the right is the cycles that smokers go through when encountering stress. In the beginning, they feel stress just like the non-smoker does. They can get upset by the stress itself. But then something happens. The urine becomes acidic. Now, the urine also became acidic on the non-smoker, but they didn't feel it. There's no side effect. There's no sign to the non-smoker that the urine is acidic. But when the smoker's urine becomes acidic, they excrete nicotine, and then they're popped into drug withdrawal. The yellow circle is illustrating that this person is feeling bad. Not only are they feeling stress at the moment, but they are feeling drug withdrawal on top of the stress. There are four things a smoker can do now under this circumstance. One thing they can do is not solve the problem and smoke a cigarette. And lo and behold, they'll start to feel better. Now it's un crucial to understand what better means. Better means they feel just like the non-smoker who hasn't solved their problem yet. They're not in withdrawal anymore because they replenished the nicotine, but they're not feeling any better than a non-smoker who faced the same stress would be feeling at this moment in time. They just wouldn't be in withdrawal anymore. Now another thing they can do, which is great, is solve the problem and smoke a cigarette. Well, then life is wonderful. Things are complete. They are just happy people, no longer in withdrawal, and their stress is gone. 
They're like a non-smoker who solved the problem. They're not in withdrawal, and they don't have any stress. But there's two other states that the smoker can end up in, represented here. The first one on the right is they could solve the problem, but not smoke. Well, this one is particularly annoying because the problem is gone. They've resolved it, and they still feel crummy. The withdrawal was not going to ease by the problem being resolved. And then the worst state, the absolute worst, not solve the problem and not smoke a cigarette. You don't want to be around people like this. You don't want to be a person like this, but this is a state of life that smokers find themselves in a lot these days. Working in environments or living in environments that won't let them smoke, giving them stress. And again, these people have no resort except to face these stresses, not smoke a cigarette, and deal with stress and withdrawal simultaneously. The day a person quits smoking, they end that cycle. They will now face stress as a ex-smoker, which in a sense is very similar to how non-smokers face it. But they don't have drug withdrawal complicating it. Given equivalent stress as an ex-smoker, most people will find that they are calmer than when they were smoking. And yet, all the time that they were smoking, they believed they need cigarettes to calm them down. It was turning them into more nervous people under stressful episodes than they would have been if they just would stop smoking. When people learn the dangers of smoking and also start to understand how bad they may feel because they are smokers, they may often try to quit smoking. The problem is, if they do this with limited understanding, they could panic. They'll have plenty of nicotine in them at the moment that they stop smoking. They toss their cigarettes and that's it. But then the nicotine level starts to drop and then their body starts wrecking havoc on them. It starts making their mind want a cigarette. It starts coming up with reasons why they should smoke. The imagination of, do I want to be a fat non-smoker all my life or a skinny smoker? That's one of the first rationalizations that some people will pick up trying to justify their smoking. Then the nicotine gets lower. The people go into real drug withdrawal states and then they kick themselves or why am I doing this to myself? This hurts. This is painful. Why am I doing this? If they could just hang in and get the nicotine out of their system to get through the three-day period. And for some people, it's only a one-day period. For some people, it's a two. And for some, it's a three. But if they can get through that three-day period and nicotine is eradicated, they will start to physically feel better. And then as they start learning to more, do more and more things and get more associations out of the way and prove to themselves that their life goes on without smoking, they can become truly free of nicotine and they can feel a great sense of freedom and reap benefits that go for quality of life improvements and for health improvements and just generally living longer and better. It is a wonderful way of life when people pull it off. It may be tough getting there, but it's worth the effort considering the pain and suffering that they can go through if they don't quit smoking and get anything wrong that smoking can cause. Once they break free, they can stay free forever, as long as they simply remember to stick to the personal commitment they made to never take another puff.